Did you ever see Joni Lamb? She has a Christian television station. Her husband, just Marcus Lamb, he died of COVID a couple years ago. I just happened to see Perry Stone was on there one day and she was on there with Perry Stone. and She said one thing that really kind of struck me. She said uh, that she had had a person on her on her show that had been that had died and gone to hell and he, he or she I, I don't know if it was a man or a woman said that um, when God brought them back they said that the, one of the <clears throat> most amazing things about hell was the total lack of the presence of God and this person wasn't a believer before they went to hell. They said, even as non-believers, you don't understand how much presence of God there is on the earth. And when you're taken from that, it's just that total lack of the presence of God. And that peace that comes with the presence of God, even in a really confusing and tumultuous world, there's still the presence of God here. This sermon's pretty tough for me to... <clears throat> I was writing a whole other sermon. And... <clears throat> this, it's just a weird chain of events, and God gave me this. I preached at this one time, but I never really preached it because I didn't understand it, but... There's so much in Scripture. You know what's weird about Christianity is Christianity doesn't really give you understanding like Jesus gave. What Jesus gave was so far beyond what we understand as Christians. He's so enigmatic. And so... This is a lot of this that I want to give you today. It's stuff that Jesus said. There's some th other things that some other people wrote, but I want to give you this. <clears throat> you know, I really care about you. You know that, right? You know, I wouldn't tell you anything that I, if I didn't really care, genuinely care. This is called Believers in Hell. John 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. And he was a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, and he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God is with him. You know, so we see the, this Pharisee, and his name is Nicodemus, and he's talking to Jesus. And it's funny because he says to Jesus, we know, he uses the word we, we know that you're sent by God. We see the miracles you do. We know that God is with you. We know. And then I thought, who is we? And then I realized it's, it's Nicodemus and all his Pharisee cronies that have been talking about Jesus being sent from God. The Pharisees know that Jesus does all that he does because God is with him. That's what he says. Because God is with him. The word with is meta. It means an intimate participation and association. And it means to accompany. We understand that God is very intimate with you. That's what, that's what he said. So the Pharisees have discussed the Jesus phenomena. And they know that it's God doing the miracles through Jesus because of the anointing that's on Jesus' life. How many understand that these Jewish scholars know the stories about Samson and Gideon and David and all the other Old Testament characters who were specifically empowered by the Holy Ghost to accomplish supernatural feats. They know, they read, and the Holy Ghost came on Samson, and the Holy Ghost came on Gideon, and the Holy Ghost came on all these different figures in the old. They knew that, didn't they? 
Matthew 12. I saw something in this, and I need to show it to you. Then there was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. I could be teaching the children's class today. <laughs> and all the people were amazed, and they said, Is this not the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils except by Beelzebub the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if by Beelzebub, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man, and then will he spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me. He that gathers not with me scatters abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. This is one, probably one of the most terrifying scriptures in Scripture. Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. I think that not only is this one of the most terrifying scriptures in scripture, in fact, I think it's hidden here because every time this is read, all we hear is about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But there's concealed things here in this scripture that Jesus hid on purpose to see if anybody would see them. Jesus is warning the Pharisees that they were in danger of crossing a line from which there was no return. Like we saw in John 3, the Pharisees knew that Jesus came from God, yet here they're attributing his miracles to Satan because of their great frustration, their jealousy, and their envy toward Jesus. So Jesus warns them, don't ever refer to God things as being from Satan or you will be eternally damned. So we've referred to this sin as unpardonable. How many have heard that? The unpardonable sin, which is defined as unforgivable. Now, if you look up the word unforgivable in Webster, it's behavior that's too bad to forgive. That's what Webster calls it. Behavior that is too bad to forgive. Jesus was actually warning them. There's a line in the spirit realm, and if you cross that line, there's no return. There's no more mercy. There's no more pardon. There's no more potential to change your eternal destination. I listened to a, a preacher one time, and he said, he preached on blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And he said, in his entire lifetime, he was an evangelist for like 50 years. And in his, in his entire lifetime, he said, I've known 21 men personally who have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and all 21 were dead within 24 hours. Terrifying, huh? How many know that God's serious? How many understand that this sin is not committed by your behavior or your actions? It's committed with your words alone. You commit this sin with your mouth. Look at verse 31 again. Wherefore I say unto you, 
all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. How many are thankful for forgiveness? The word forgiveness is afi i me in the Greek. Afi i me. It means to set aside, to remit, or to cancel. Forgiven. To set aside, to remit, or to cancel. And Jesus says these words here. All sin and blasphemy. How many have ever blasphemed? See, this is, this is something that we don't even think about because it's two different categories. Jesus says all sin and all blasphemy. The word blasphemy is scurrilous. How many use that word a lot? Scurrilous. Or calumnious. I'm going to use that word a lot. Scurrilous and calumnious. Now I could say that and you'd go, wow, phew, I've never done any of those things. They literally translate to speak willfully, maliciously, or hurtfully against. So when I look at this and I think of my own life, and I would ask you to ask yourself, how many have ever spoken against another person using blasphemous words or hurtful, willfully hurtful words? Maybe you spoke critically to their face, and maybe you spoke critically behind their back. Why would you do that? Look at verses 34 and 35 again. Jesus said, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. Here's what Jesus said. You say what's in your heart. The word evil, he uses the word evil. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. It's paniros, evil. The word evil is this. See, when we think of evil, we think of, you know, anything that's demonic. We think of you know, crimes that are beyond what we would even consider, you know, to be wicked, evil. But actually, evil is harmful, vicious, blaming, fault-finding, or critical words. How many know that Jesus sees criticism as evil? No, no, you've got to stop and think. Jesus sees critical words as evil. Jesus does. I've heard a lot of people use critical words against others and then say, you know, well, it, it's true. How many have ever heard somebody do that? And they'd say something and go, well, it's true. How many believe that Jesus says, oh, okay, as long as it's true, that's fine. Jesus said, when we have evil in our heart, our mouth will prove it. I've wept over this sermon. Look at 36 and 37 again. But I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. This is terrifying. For by your word you'll be justified. And by your word you'll be condemned. Most translations, or many translations, say this. 
Men will account for every careless word that they've spoken on earth. Why? Because your careless words prove to you how much evil still resides in your heart and you ignore the warnings. See, when you speak against another, it's proving what's in your heart. And we ignore that. That's why you said we're going to give an account of it. You say, this is terrible. Don't worry, this gets worse. I'm just the messenger. I hear it and I just, he says it to me and then I just have to bring it to you. Why? Because your careless words prove how much still evil still resides in your heart. <clears throat> how many were ever under the impression, and, and just, I know this is hard, it just, how many were ever under the impression that you could say harsh things to or about someone and then just whisper, forgive me, Lord. Lord, I'm sorry I said that. Forgive me. How many think that it's just going to be fine when you do that? You know, Christianity doesn't and has never taught me. Doesn't understand God's ways or God's methods of justice. We don't understand. I have, once I started into this subject, I saw so many things in this subject. Jesus says here that you might have perfect behavior. You might have given up every bad thing that you used to do. But your words will still be your downfall. Proverbs 10 says when words are many, sin becomes unavoidable. The word condemned, it actually comes from two words with damnation. But in the Greek, it means to be judged guilty, to be shown justice. To be judged guilty, to be shown justice, and to be punished. I saw a video. It was accidental. I, it was, it was a com Hey, did you ever have something happen and you knew God did it? You, you knew God led you there. You knew that God did it. Random, random, and God led me to this random video. And it was a testimony, and I believe it went viral. And it was given by a pastor named Gerald Johnson. And he has a, like a Pentecostal type church in Austin, Texas. He's a tongue-talking, Jesus-worshipping son of God. Literally, when you see him, you can see God on him. How many have ever seen people and you went, wow, you can see God on them? He's like that. He's a lover of God. He said one day he was in his bedroom and he began to feel this tightness in his chest. And he collapsed. He said, I collapsed on my bed and immediately, he said, I was aware that my spirit left my body. And he said he went up for, he started going up right away and he, he said, everything just appeared well. I thought, I'm glad all my life insurance is paid up. My wife will be fine. He said, I'm thinking all these things while I'm leaving my body. And he said, I'm going up. He said, I went up for a ways. I'm on my way to heaven is what I completely believe. And suddenly, he said, he began to go down. And he descended into the center of the earth. He said the next thing that he knew, he was standing in hell. And he said it was, wasn't a dream. I know it wasn't a dream because he said at no time was I asleep. He said he couldn't believe he was in hell. He said, I lived my life so diligently serving God. He said, he, as a Christian, he truly believed that he was doing better than most. He said, I was, 
He said, I spent so much time praying with people, praying for them, helping them. I dedicated my life to Christ. In fact, he said, when I felt like I was dying, when I got these chest pains, he said, I'm there rebuking the devil. He said, I'm praying in tongues. I begin worshiping. He said, worship is always my go-to with God. He said, every bad situation, I worship. But he said, even so, he was in hell. And all he could think was, after all my sacrifice for God, why did I still go to hell? Amazing testimony. And he said he was shown some things in hell. And then suddenly he said, I was lifted out of that horrible place. And I returned to my body there on my bed in my bedroom. And he said that when I sat up on the bed, Jesus was in the room with me. He said, I had never seen Jesus before. He said, I've been a Christian a long time. He said, Jesus was in my room. And he said, and Jesus began to rebuke me. The Jesus that he served diligently with all of his heart. The Jesus that he worshipped continually. And Jesus began to rebuke him. He said, you know what was amazing about Jesus' rebuke? I felt more love from Jesus' rebuke than I've ever felt from another human being that loved me dearly. He said, I've had my wife say beautiful things to me or my mother say beautiful things to me and I never felt the love of them the way I felt from Jesus rebuking me. He said, Jesus' rebuke had to do with all the people who, who had offended him as a pastor. Jesus told him that he saw the feelings of his heart. And he saw that he had negative, deep down he had negative feelings. Not that he didn't forgive them, but deep down he still had negative feelings for people who had hurt him. He said deep down, Jesus told him he was hoping that Jesus would pay them back for how harshly they had been toward him. And that God sees this as evil treasure. Look at the word 35 again. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth the evil things. The word treasure is actually weirdly, it's the word thesaurus. It's a storage of deposits that are made in the heart. It's where we got the... the English word thesaurus, which is translated a storehouse of words. A storehouse of words. Jesus used that when he said treasure. He said, your heart is a storehouse for words. How many have ever been involved in a, I call it, human encounter? And then you end up saying something that you regret. Yeah, I don't get him very often, but I had a couple in my life probably. Or maybe you're talking about a human encounter and you say something about another person and you think, wow, I shouldn't have said that. You might even think, I wonder where that came from. Have you ever said something and you went, wow, I wonder where that came from? During your lifetime, people have hurt you, offended you, abused you, criticized you, betrayed you, and rejected you. You've been through a multitude of disappointments, 
with a lot of destructive potential. So you wonder, do you purge these from your soul or deposit them? Now, <clears throat> we can't be flippant or casual about this as Christianity. How many know Christianity has a lot of cliched sayings? I can't stand cliches. You ask Christians about it and they say, oh, I've dealt with that. Or it's under the blood. Or, yeah, I've forgiven them. <clears throat> How many understand this? What you believe won't matter when you stand before the judge. What you believe about your heart in order to cover up, it won't matter when you stand before the judge. The only thing that will matter when you stand before him is he's going to see what was deposited in your heart. And the only way that you can know is by the words that you speak because your words will betray and expose your heart. Not the words you normally speak when all's well. But what comes out of your mouth when you're grumpy or when you're upset or when you're tired or you're hungry or physically you don't feel good or emotionally you don't feel good? See, that's when the things come out. It's like tea, tea. The tea kettle doesn't whistle until the water boils. It's hot water that causes you to respond. And those, those are the times. See, you can't say, well, I normally just say, oh, God, you know, thank you for this abuse. I count it all joy that I can be abused for your kingdom. It's not those times. It's that off time, that off time, when all of a sudden something comes out. At that time is when you need to go, wow, there it is. It, there's a deposit. It's still there. Let me show you something. You might not believe this, and it's fine if you don't. But Jesus said some things that have never been explained well by men. And especially men in Christianity. That being said, Matthew 18. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king. When Jesus uses the word certain, this isn't a parable anymore. This is true. This is absolutely, you can take this to the bank. Which would take account of his servants. How many are a servant? Okay, how many know there's going to be an account taken? And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had in payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. Even though he knew he couldn't, he was begging. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and he loosed him, and he forgave him the debt. But the same servant, this same guy who's just been forgiven, the same servant went out, found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid his hands on him, and he took him by the throat, and he said, pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. And he wouldn't. But he went and cast him into a prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and they came and they told their Lord all that was done. <clears throat> then his Lord, after that he had called him, he said unto him, O oh, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired me. You asked me to forgive you. Shouldn't you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was wroth. He was angry and he delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. 
so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you do not from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. I know I talked about this one other time. I've never been brave enough to say this, but I want to preach something. I want to tell you something in a very short amount of time that I have left. I want to tell you a couple things. How many are pretty sure that Jesus understands God and the kingdom and eternity better than you do? And he understands it better than Christianity does, amen? He's seen some things. He knows some things because he's seen some things. Let me ask you a question. How many trust Jesus? How many trust Jesus more than you trust Christianity? Amen? Because Christianity's been taught by men, and men are fallible, right? Men make mistakes. Jesus doesn't. See, the problem is that Christians believe what Christianity taught them, and therefore they refuse to consider anything that Christianity considers to be untrue. Jesus says for some, some really disturbing things here, and when you look at them, Christianity, even the great scholars of Christianity literally have no answers for them. They don't know. Let me ask you a question. How do you know when you're sick? How many, when you're sick, you exhibit symptoms of sickness, right? Symptoms or manifestations are physical or mental features which are regarded as indicators of a condition of a disease. How many have ever been deathly ill, but you had zero symptoms? I know I am dying here. What are your symptoms? Well, I don't have any. And your doctor would go, you got one. <laughs> right? Sickness always, 100% of the time, manifests through symptoms. Amen? Physical illness always has symptoms. Mental illness always has symptoms. Spiritual illness always has symptoms. The manifestation of spiritual illness is always in the thoughts and moves then to the mouth at some point. The pastor that I mentioned earlier that was taken to hell and he was shown some things, Pastor Johnson. He said when he was there, there was intense heat, but he didn't see any flames. How many of you noticed that there when people have visions of hell, they're always different. You, you, th there's a reason for that. <clears throat> there's different levels of hell, and the levels of hell are for different purposes. When Gerald Johnson went to hell, he said he felt betrayed by God. Because as he explained, he had lived an exemplary life as a Christian. I mean, this guy was always praying in tongues and worshiping, reading his Bible and praying for people, interceding, fasting, doing all the Christian things, felt a life close to God. And he felt betrayed by God because now he was in hell. But what he didn't realize is that God didn't betray him Christianity betrayed him because Christianity failed to warn him. It also fails to teach us the consequences of entering eternity with evil treasure in our hearts. Have you ever wondered if you die with what God considers evil treasure in your heart, how is it eliminated? See, Christianity has a lot of cliched pat answers for that, but none of them work with Jesus' topic on the servants being judged. 
In 1 Timothy, Paul says something interesting. He says, some men's sins are open beforehand, leading them to judgment, while other men's sins follow them to judgment. It's kind of terrifying, isn't it? And he's talking about Christians. He's talking about the church. Let me ask you this question. How many don't want any judgment day surprises? Amen? Amen. Gerald Johnson, when he was in hell, he said he saw a man. And he said that this man was, he said he was down on all fours like he was a dog. Said he, he was an unrecognizable. It looked like he had been burnt. But he said he's on all fours like a dog and he has a chain around his neck. And he said the chain was being held by this demonic looking figure. He knew, he said, he, nobody spoke words. It was all you could just hear it. He said he knew that this demon had been assigned to this man for his entire life while he was on earth to keep him bound and bring him to that place of torment. That demon was assigned to that man to bring him to that place. He said, I knew it. In an interview, Pastor Johnson said, he wasn't told this by God, but he said, I knew and I felt in my spirit that that chain represented bitterness in that man's life. And that chain of bitterness had held him in bondage until it brought him into that place of torment. See what we don't understand. I said to Carol, we're sitting at breakfast one day and I said, isn't it amazing we're sitting here having this pleasant breakfast together in this beautiful place and there are people in hell being tormented. You know, another thing he said, this is just random. He said he was taken to a place in hell. And he said he heard the songs, the rock music being played and sung by demons. He said these, these, he said the lyrics for the music are all demonically inspired. He said in these musicians, the way they get it is he said, they, he said the Lord showed him they take mushrooms and acid and LSD and, and they smoke marijuana. And then through that, through that, they enter illegally into the supernatural realm and they're given these lyrics by the demonic. He said in the same songs are being sung in these places to torment the people. He said you'd be tormented because all your life instead of you should have been worshiping and singing praises unto God and you're being mocked because of the things you might have listened to that weren't of God. You say, I don't have bitterness, Dan. Maybe not. Listen to your words when you're in a hard place. You can't reject that. That's the symptoms. Your words undeniably prove what's in your heart and it's by your words that you're justified or it's by your words you're condemned. You know I'm only giving you this because he told it to me and I wept over this but I just want you to know something. It's because I care about you. Because I don't want you to say Dan never told us Lord. How many know that Jesus' brother James wrote the book of James? James had a lot to say about our words. Look at James 5. I got, I got to hurry. He said, be patient, establish your hearts. He's warning us, for the coming of the Lord draws near. Grudge not against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. How many have no idea what he's talking about when he says, grudge not against one another? The word grudge is stenadzo. You know what, you want me to tell you what it means? Don't murmur against other people. Don't pray inaudibly. It literally means don't think on thoughts. Have, do you, does your mind ever think things about somebody and you catch yourself in the middle of something negative thinking about somebody? Yeah. And sometimes you even say it. You're just talking to yourself. 
He says, don't grudge, don't sigh, don't even go. How many have ever had people that just irritate you to the point you go, oh, that's what James is warning about. He said, don't complain about them. How many have people that cause this reaction in you? James said, don't do this. And then he uses the word lest. The word lest in the Greek means if you want to prevent what is undesirable from happening to you, don't do this. If you want to prevent it, if you don't want to be judged for this, it's an undesirable judgment. Lest you be what? Condemned. And the word condemned is krino in the, in the Greek. And it literally translates sentenced to punishment. Weirdly, Jesus says something similar in Matthew 7. Judge not that you don't be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you'll be judged. And with what measure you meet, it will be measured to you again. There's so much, so much truth in this. I, I see so much, I'd like to tell you, but I don't have time. He said, why do you behold the mote that is in your brother's eye, but you don't even consider the beam that is in your own eye? Jesus said that our fault-finding criticism of others will cause us to be judged without mercy on judgment day. He's saying that when you use words to punish people, either to their face or behind their back, you are preparing yourself for a judgment that you cannot escape. Pastor Johnson saw that place of punishment. And he said, it was so terrifying there. I wouldn't wish it on the worst enemy that I have. Look at one more time at Matthew 18. And the Lord, after that he had called him, he said unto him, Oh, you wicked servant, how many do not want to hear these words from Christ? Oh, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired me. Shouldn't you also have compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. Jesus says, after the Lord had called this servant, it literally means the servant was summoned to judgment. He died. That's what he's talking about. Jesus says, so the master calls this servant to judgment. He dies, and he's standing before the Lord. He's standing before Jesus. And he was found to have been hiding evil treasure in his heart. That's what it says. And his Lord was angry. Jesus was angry. And he sent him to prison to be judged, punished. This is literally what it translates, by the jailers. Christianity doesn't teach you that. You can say, Dan, I don't believe it. It's fine. If, you, if you're a risk taker, have at it. Just want you to know what Jesus said. And he, the Lord was angry, sends him to be punished by the jailers. And the jailers put him in chains. Reminds you of a story I just told, doesn't it? Until when? See this word till? Jesus actually used the Greek word right there. We use the word until. The word till or until is heos. It means for a time. It means for a while. For multitudes... There's going to be a, a season of suffering. I didn't make this up. For multitudes, there's going to be a season of suffering. Look at verse 35 again. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do unto you, if you do not from your hearts forgive everyone his brother that trespasses. Jesus warns us that this punishment will absolutely happen to all those whose hearts aren't purged of every evil treasure that's been deposited over the course of an entire lifetime. You say, but Christianity doesn't teach this, Dan. That's a Catholic teaching. You're talking about Catholic things. It's not true. 
How many know the Jewish rabbis have taught this for a long, long time? They believe it and they still teach it. This is an Old Testament belief. That's why when Jesus taught it, they weren't shocked. They already knew it was true. One more scripture. Give me two more minutes. Matthew 12. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. There's the hope. How many are thankful for that? But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. And look what he says. Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, nor in the world to come. Now there's something you completely messed up. He said, all blasphemy shall be forgiven in a purging or purifying process, all the evil deposits will be purged, will be forsaken. That's literally what it translates. To forsake is also to permanently release and let go of. Every sin and blasphemy that is committed against the Spirit of God, there will be no forgiveness, he says, in this world or in the next world. How many saw that? Jesus is implying something that we completely missed. He's expressing that there's potential for forgiveness in this world and in the next world. When my eyes opened to that, I went, wow, I never saw that before. How many ever saw that before? Isn't that an amazing thought? But God is a just God. Everything he does is just. He doesn't do anything beyond justice. He doesn't do anything less than justice. That's what you have to know. When God judges, he doesn't go less than justice or beyond justice. How many ever thought, wow, that seems extreme. God is just. There are things about judgment. There are things about eternity. There are things about God that we have never been taught and we don't understand. The subject's mentioned actually many times in Scripture. I'd like to look at it again maybe next week if God gives me something on it. But I want you to know this. I want every person here to be prepared to stand in judgment before the king. I want every person here to be ready to stand in front. Because it's not that long. Whether, whether the rapture happens, which I believe is a very short time away, or whether we go because of just natural causes of old age, it doesn't take long before you're in old age, right? It doesn't take long before you're getting older and you're going, I used to have hair with color in it. Now if I want hair with color, I'd have to do it with a bottle. But I want every person in this place, when you stand before the king, do you know how aware of your words you're going to be this week? I want to, I want to show you some things next week on this. But you're going to be more aware of what you say. You're going to be more aware of what you think. Even what you think about somebody. See, it wasn't that Gerald Johnson was saying evil things about people. It was just how he felt in his heart. You know, it's easy to think, well, I, I'm not really that as long as I'm not doing the deed of saying the words. It's not true. The evil deposits are there. He sees my heart. He sees the deep parts of my heart. He weighs my heart. He examines my heart. This week, you need to just begin to... I've been repenting, like, constant. I just need him so bad. I need purged. I need purified. I need washed. I need the blood to cleanse all of that 
even from back years. You know, I've been thinking of people and things all week that I never even thought in years. When you start really seeing how desperately you need to be purged, all of a sudden you'll remember things that happened when you were a kid in school. You'll remember things people said to you or something they did to you or how they embarrassed you or how they rejected you or just all the things that people have said that have hurt you. You begin to remember and you begin able to revisit those places and purge those things from your heart. Because that's what God wants. He doesn't want any deposits left in there. No deposits of evil left in your heart. He wants them gone. Whether you have to fast, cry out, be on your face, whatever it takes, you need to give up life to find true life. This life, Jesus said, you've got to lay it down. You've got to lay it down. It will consume you. And we have to find him while there's time. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Amen. Stand with me if you would. Father, we're just thankful that you would allow us to see this before the day comes. Because none of us can say that every part has been purged. None of us. It's too arrogant to think because it has to be a thorough, a thorough cleansing. And only the Spirit of God can shine a light on those dark places in our heart where we've hidden these things. Only the Spirit of God can show us. Father, I'm asking you that you would begin to reveal in every heart, all the things. Lord, and if any harsh word is said this week, if any harsh thing comes up in a heart, that they would begin to say, Lord, why is that there? What caused that to be there? I spoke a harsh word. There's got to be something in there that's holding it. That demon that held that man with that chain of bitterness around his neck, that demon was sent to minister, continually lies to that man so that he could eventually take him into that place of torment. And punishment. So, Father, I'm asking you that you would reveal those parts to us so that we would be ready to stand before you. I believe the rapture is coming soon, and I'll tell you what I also believe. I believe that a multitudes of Christians are still going to be here. And I believe it because God is going to have to deal harshly through a time of tribulation with a lot of people just in order to bring them into his kingdom. Father, I ask that we would be ready, that we would waste no time, but that we would spend our time seeking desperately for your Holy Spirit to shine a light in our heart and show us what we really look like in this short time that we have left so that we might stand before you. Lord, more than anything, we just want to hear, well done. We don't want to hear, depart from me, you wicked servant. We want to hear, well done. So, Father, I'm asking you to teach us your way that we might prepare our hearts, show us, Open our eyes, O oh God, that we might see how you see us, that we might make ourselves ready to meet you.